this is an interactive uh, workshop, so hopefully you all brought your laptops. If not, you can pair up with somebody else that did, but um, I'm going to be giving you some instructions on here, and then you'll actually be following them yourselves, so you can see Auto DevOps in action. Um, just a quick rundown of the agenda. Um, we're going we're to actually jump right in to having you clone a project to actually kick off Auto DevOps. Uh, and then while that's building, because it takes five or ten minutes to run Auto DevOps, then I'll take some time to explain what it is and, and go into some backstory and things like that. And then at some point we'll check in on you know, how your, lap, how your uh, pipeline's doing. So uh, just to run through some prerequisites, you do need a laptop but you can pair up with somebody else if you don't have a laptop. So maybe uh, raise your hand if you need a partner. And anybody who wants to volunteer to work with you? All right, great. Anybody still need a partner? Cool. And then uh, obviously with a laptop, you need internet access. Um, you'll need a gitlab.com login and uh, you'll need maintainer access, which I think Daniel has already set up for everybody, but there will come a point where if you run into something and it complains about permissions because maybe you registered at the last minute or you didn't register ahead of time, we might not have given you permissions, so just raise your hand, or actually there's a channel, a Slack channel, ws-autodevops-101. You could ping Daniel, don't ping me because I won't get the ping. Um, ping Daniel or, or, uh, or jo uh, Joel. Um, and then they can help you. Actually, can you stand, uh, uh, Daniel, Joel, stand up for a moment just so everybody knows. They're going to be helping you out. If you have any technical problems, whatever, just raise your hand and somebody will come help you. But specifically, we ran into this earlier where we thought developer access was enough, but it turns out you need maintainer access. Um, and then just to let you know ahead of time, we already have created a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and so in this group specifically, so when you create the project, you'll want to create it in the group we've told you to create it in, otherwise you won't really get full access to everything. So this is it, really this is actually the one slide you need to do. <clears throat> and uh, I think we've pasted the links to this in the Slack channel, or that might be easier for you to find, rather than having to type out this URL. But basically go to the group, um, which is under GitLab org, and it's called Contribute Workshops. And, uh, and then you're going you're to go create a project under that group. Um, so just follow the instructions there. You'll want to copy and paste that URL for the minimal Ruby app. And so what you're going to do basically is create a project cloning from that other project so that you get, uh, well, it's a really, really trivial Ruby app. You really could start with anything. You could create a, use the project templates to create it, but... Um, but this is just a smaller app that actually will just build faster and deploy a little faster. Um, and then just some reminders, when you do create the project, you're gonna need to set the project slug to something unique. And there is a little bit of a gotcha. If you set the project name, but you forget to set the project slug, you might run into a problem because you're gonna try to create a project that somebody else already did. So make sure the slug is unique, not just the, uh, the name. Uh, and then also set your project to public it doesn't really matter, but it just helps us debug things if you need to. Um, and that's really it. And, uh, but after you create that project, Auto DevOps is enabled, again, for the group. So every project under there will just automatically start building. That's the magic of Auto DevOps. Um, but it won't run the first time, so you actually have to do this one step at the bottom, which is to run the pipeline. So just follow the steps there. Go to CICD pipelines and hit run pipeline. Anybody got their project created so far? Will people good? Is the pipeline kicked off? Good, good. Just something unique, but yeah, your name would be. Not for you can't use spaces in the slug. It shouldn't let you. It should fail on that one. For the so not just the project name. Project name you can have spaces. Project slug you can't. That's the difference. So you can make it look pretty if you want. You can give it a name, but. Here, and just really quickly, I'll... You can make it public. You don't need a description. So you just go, new project. Oh, I didn't actually copy the URL before I did that. It's actually right in the thing, so you can just copy-paste from there. It's in the description of the group. 
So go to import project, repo by URL, paste in the URL for the minimal Ruby app, and then go down here to the project slug, and click on public. Again, that's not necessary, but you can leave the, the project name blank. You can, but the slug is the one that's important to change. Yep, so this git repository URL, that's where you paste it in this minimal Ruby app. <clears throat> so uh, slug is like the unique string that will show up in the URL, and it's kind of like you can't have spaces or things like that because it's got to be a URL, um, whereas the name, you can make it prettier. You can put capitals and spaces and apostrophes and other kinds of things in there. Um, you don't need it, obviously, like in this case, I just gave it a slug, I didn't give it a name, and that's totally fine. But if I really wanted to, if I wanted to add a space between workshop and two, I could do that. But you need to have the slug. And the slug has to be the thing that's unique as well. So you could technically, I guess, have the project name could be non-unique, I think. But the slug has to be unique. So you don't need to configure it. It's already configured, but it doesn't start running right away. So if you made a change, if you pushed up a change or something like that, then it would kick in. But in order to get it to kick off the first time, just go to CI, CD, and pipelines, and then hit run pipeline. And if all everything works, this should actually kick off. But if your permissions are wrong, that may actually fail. So quick, quick show of hands, who's got the first pipeline running? Cool. That's pretty good. So, all right, well, while that's running, so <clears throat> just wanted to talk about like what is Auto DevOps. As you saw, it, it's, it, fundamentally, it fundamentally comes down to it's a pipeline. It is a CI CD pipeline that we have defined for you. And you notice in the project, there's no GitLab CI YAML file there. The project knows nothing about CI CD, it's just a little Ruby app. Um, but we know how to build that Ruby app, and we know how to test it and do security analysis, all this other kind of stuff. We know how to do that. And so Auto DevOps is basically all these best practices um, that we want to encourage everybody to have, but we believe is a good baseline for software development, and we put all those best practices into one pipeline that then is available so that anybody who deploys an app just gets that pipeline. Now, literally, it is still a GitLab CI YAML file, but it's not in your repo. It's in one master place on, your, um, on the server, in this case, gitlab.com. And so what we're really doing is just saying, we know that that's the, the, the YAML file that we're going to run by default, and we'll just automatically run it. So what you get then is, if you weren't doing this as a project clone, you would have seen like, oh, I pushed up my first code. And as soon as I push it up, it would have just kicked off the pipeline right away. If you make any edits to the files, it will just kick off a new pipeline right away. So again, it's CI, CD, but with a bunch of best practices built in. Um, so actually, well, before I jump into a little bit, I want to talk about why we built Auto DevOps. And, um, and the, the thing here is, is we want to make it really, really easy for everybody to do CI, CD, but also not to just do sort of the bare minimum CI, CD. Like most people, when they create a project, they start with, okay, well, we'll run tests. That's the natural thing for CI. And then that maybe they'll even get into CD, but they're not going to do things like code quality analysis and security analysis. And we really believe in you know, the shift left movement. Um, you know, if you look at everything as a pipeline, we want to take you know, security and things like that were stuck at the end, and we want to move them as far left as possible. And we believe even on your first deploy, you should be checking for the security. So we said, okay, let's put all that in there and make you know, a script that says, this is, this is everything that you should be doing, so let's just do it for you. The history is that actually the Auto DevOps really started as Auto Deploy. Our first version of this just did deploys. And in fact, the first version uh, was a deployment onto OpenShift because um, it was just a, a convenient platform at the time. And, um, and so it started off with just doing deployments to production and staging on OpenShift. And then we evolved it, as the company evolved, to have more and more capabilities around the DevOps lifecycle. We put all those capabilities into Auto DevOps. 
Um, you know, the first versions of Auto DevOps only had a couple of jobs, and now there's, I don't know, 12 jobs or something defined. It's, it's a really complicated script, frankly. Um, there's a lot in Auto DevOps. I'll just run through them really quickly, and then I'll actually show you in the pipeline what they look like. But the first thing is building. If you have a Docker file in your uh, project, like the example you just cloned, uh, then we'll actually just build the Docker file. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we have thought about it. Uh, about a year ago or so, when we came up with this strategy to go to DevOps, DevSecOps was starting to get popular, but we didn't, we didn't want to start going. We have this slide, actually, where it's like, um, DevSec biz design ops, because it's like, well, we do all this stuff. And so we just said, look, we're just going to call it DevOps, because DevOps really isn't just dev and ops anyway. It's really everything around software development and um, operations and delivery and securing and whatever. It's everything that's involved. And so we just like, let's just call it DevOps. The reality is, though, that since then, DevSecOps has become much more popular. And security really is kind of a third pillar in our product. It's of equal size, probably, to the dev on the ops portion. So I think some of our marketing campaigns will start talking about DevSecOps more. But I think we're still. We're still just keeping the product, you know, the auto DevOps name there. It's just about DevOps. Because, again, it is far more than just even DevSec and, uh, Dev and, Sec and Ops. Um, so anyway, so going back to the builds, if you don't have a Docker file, we will actually detect what language you've got, and we will try to build that. And we'll actually use Heroku build packs to build it. So we can detect if it's Ruby, we'll try to build it a certain way. If it's... Uh, I don't know, Java will build it a different way. And so we'll actually build that up and then create a Docker file in, or a Docker image in the end, and then that will be the build part. Then we'll try and test it, and we'll again use the Heroku build packs for that. Not all languages are supported for that, but if we do detect it and we can support it, then, uh, then we'll try to test it automatically. Code quality analysis, um, we'll just run that again. Uh, it'll, it'll be based on um, the open source version of Code Climate. And then we'll display those code quality results right in the merge request um, or yeah, in the merge request if you make a change. And then there's a whole bunch of um, security testing. So static analysis, um, static application security testing, dependency scanning, license management, um, container scanning. All those things kick off, again, right from your first deploy. So really taking shift left there. And then auto review apps, which is really awesome stuff. So when you make a new branch and you push up a change and you're about to make a merge request or something like that, we'll actually go and automatically deploy your change into another environment specifically for you to be able to review what that change looks like live. And then once we've got that review app, we can actually run dynamic application security testing on it. So we actually have, um, I'm not sure which tool it is, but there's an open source tool that will then try to detect problems in your, uh, or security vulnerabilities in your running application, which is really cool. Um, then auto deploy, when you merge it back into master, we will automatically deploy that to production or to staging if that's how you've got it configured, but um, which I'll get to later how to do that. But by default, it deploys to production. And so really, you've got, you know, from first push, it just automatically does all this stuff all the way to, to deployment, to production, which is pretty great. Once it's in production, we'll actually then run browser performance testing on it, too, which really is just kind of, it simulates a browser hitting your website, hits slash on your application, and then starts, you know, recording how long that whole process takes. And then we've got that benchmark, and then if you make another merge request that slows things down a lot, we can actually note how much that slowed things down, or so that you know before you actually deploy whether you've slowed something down. Yeah? I don't think so. I think right now we just tell you what the delta is, whether it's faster or slower. We don't have a threshold. There's no alerts by default, I think, on performance testing. We don't fail the pipeline. So we'll tell you that it's slower, but we'll still let you go ahead and deploy. And then auto monitoring um, is, you know, again, whether it's after it's in production or in review out, frankly, uh, we know how it's configured. We know it's on Kubernetes. We know how to, you know, instrument that, and we can automatically get things like response times and error rates and and uh, even like pod uh, CPU usage and all this kind of great stuff. And so again, all this happens without any configuration whatsoever. 
Uh, and that's really, that's why we put auto in front of all these. It's really all the, you know, almost all the capabilities of our DevOps lifecycle thrown in by default. Yeah, go ahead. I don't think we have that now, but we've definitely talked about having the ability to like create an issue from any kind of alert, but like, oh, if there's a performance issue, great, let's create an issue and then track that and somebody can triage it or whatever. Um, I don't know when that kind of thing is gonna be coming, um, but we don't today. Yeah, cool. All right, so at this point, um, it's a good time to check in. How are your applications actually doing? Um, I know I kicked off one a little while ago and uh, I think my thing finished. So I'm just gonna run through um, a little bit just to show you what the pipeline looks like. I mean, I talked about all these tasks that Auto DevOps does and includes, but this is how it's actually manifest. Again, it's a pipeline. Testing is all done in parallel because you don't really wanna wait for all the tests to happen sequentially. So the code quality analysis, license management, all these kind of tests happen in parallel. And then all the way through production, deployment, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you know, testing the performance of it. So hopefully your pipelines look like that. Anybody not have a pipeline that looked like that? Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, code client, it's still running. Well, that's one of the reasons we kicked this off a little while ago. Sometimes it can take a while. Not yet. Still cold quality, yeah, that can be a little slower. All right, well, so one of the things is now that we've got this, um, I can do a couple of things. I can look at the environments. In my case, I jumped ahead and actually created another environment, but just pretend that's not there for a moment. I've got this production environment, and you can see that I actually did this two hours ago when I did the previous workshop, but I can now open this, and I can see my running app, and it's obviously a pretty trivial app. It just says, hello world. But we've given it this URL up there, um, you know, based on zip.io, um, just to make it easier. But we've all got this, you know, I've got some unique name based on my app and the group that it's in. And uh, so all of our apps who are living on the same servers, they're all just running in their own pods when they're running. And, uh, and you'll all be able to see, you know, the hello world running on there. Exactly, so what'll happen is if you use Auto DevOps and you don't have a cluster, you'll get like the first half of it, basically. You'll get um, code quality analysis, you'll get um, the static analysis testing, you'll get a bunch of those things, but then as soon as you try to deploy, there's nothing, to, you can't deploy to anything, so it won't try to deploy. Um, you'll still get value out of it, it's still pretty cool, right? But Obviously, in order to get the real value of, of being able to deploy, you need to have a good, which is why we basically, we all had, um, we pre-configured the group so that it has a group cluster. And so you all have access to that cluster and it just made it a lot easier. You can attach, you know, clusters at the project level. Um, and so you could have just done that, but I didn't want to be configuring 30 clusters or whatever it was. Um, there are a couple of differences, though, because we chose to do a group cluster. We actually don't get as much um, capabilities. So some of the things are still being ported over. The group cluster is a relatively new thing. Uh, if this was an individual cluster, then actually I would have been able to see the deploy board here. And, and so now I'm jumping into this has nothing to do with auto DevOps anymore, but it really is part of just the whole DevOps lifecycle that when you're deploying to production, let's say, you can actually see boxes showing like, oh, you know, it's deployed halfway and there's still the rest to go. Right now there's only one pod, so it wouldn't show me very much, but you could see it, you could scale that out. And there's also monitoring, which won't work at the moment. So the, the little graph to, to see the environments and the, all the data isn't there. But if you configure the cluster at a project level and then installed Prometheus on that cluster, you'd be able to see that data a little bit more. But I skipped through that for the purposes of this workshop. Um, cool, so to see a little bit more of uh, what Auto DevOps looks like. So right now this, um, again, in my case, I've already kicked off uh, another uh, merge request. If you want to go and make a change to, you know, 
server.ib is really the only thing. And here you can go in and uh, I'll just actually edit it here. Um, <laughs> that's funny, somebody already edited it. <laughs> um, so here, you know, whatever, I'll just say, and I'll, and I'll put it, I'll, so I'll just change the hello world message to something else. Um, and put it in the target branch, which will then also um, trigger creating a, a, a new merge request. And you all can do this yourselves if you want to. What that does is it'll kick off another pipeline. And this one looks a little bit different which is why I wanted to do this whole process. It starts off the same. It still has to build it and run all the tests, but now it's going to create a review app instead, and then it'll do that dynamic security analysis on that review app, um, which is pretty cool. And it'll still do performance testing on that review app, and then it won't actually run this. It'll, pause, it'll wait for that to happen later, but when the branch is deleted, it'll automatically then delete the review app as well, which is pretty cool because you don't want to leave the pods lying around. So that actually can take quite a while as well. So I have, um, okay, so, um, so now in this case, I've kicked off a, uh, another, um, another build. It's going to take a little while. So right now there's no deployments yet. It's going it, to, it will take a while. So I'm going to go actually just look at, um, let's see if I actually did this. Okay, so I ran this one earlier, and, uh, and I had a different merge request. Which you can see isn't, you know, it was a similar, trivial little change, changed Hello World. It ran a pipeline, and then from here, I don't even have to go through to that environments page. I can actually just see it right here, view app, and I can see the app running with the my little change, Hello Workshop. So that's, you know, it's great because you can look at the code and you can see what the code was and you can review the code, but sometimes you don't really know what it's actually going to look like. And so it's really important to be able to see the, you know, the review app. And again, you get all this for free. I didn't have to configure anything from an app perspective. I could have pushed up some Java app and it still would have done this. It would have created review apps and, and uh, you know, it would have done automatically best practices built in. Has everybody been able to see their live app? Yours finally finished? Good. And so can you see your app? So if you go into, again, operations, uh, environments, probably the best place for you to see it. And then from there, you should be able to just see the thing running or see the app that is running. Yeah, I think somebody must have changed master after I did this two hours ago. <laughs> so, uh, so, I don't know, somebody merged it. It's one of the challenges of giving everybody uh, um, uh, owner credentials. Cool. So, so that's the basics of it, really. You know, in, in how long did that take? Uh, 30 minutes, basically. In our case, it took a little longer. Probably normally it wouldn't take that long, frankly, to go through. But in 30 minutes, you pushed up an app, or pushed up code, rather, and we turned it into an app, and it deployed to production, and you did nothing. Nothing to configure it, at least. But there's, um, there are some more things you can do to configure stuff. Uh, so here's a just a link to the documentation for um, all the different kind of environment variables you can set. I'm just highlighting a few of them. You can set the number of replicas, um, which is, you know, Kubernetes speak for, you know, the number of instances. And so if you set an environment variable called replicas, and you set it to three or something like that, you'll be able to scale up your instance from just one pod up to three pods. 
you can set that replicas uh, variable at uh, different levels. So I could set it for production and have it be different than for my review apps, for example. And so you can just use uh, you know, environment specific um, or yeah, environment specific variables to specify that, oh, for production, I want it for three, for staging, I want it to be two, and for everything else, it's one, that kind of stuff. Um, you can also set additional hosts. Right now, like you saw the URL was a pretty ugly URL, but if I have DNS configured and I want to have a pretty domain for my production, which is probably makes sense, you can set up additional hosts, and that, I think, should uh, allow you to have, you can access it from either one. You can have it from the, the ugly URL or the prettier URL. By default, Postgres is turned on, but that can be a waste for an app that doesn't use Postgres, so you can disable Postgres. Um, maybe you've got a project where the Heroku build packs don't know how to test your project, and so that just fails. And rather than having to make then a custom pipeline, you could just set a variable to you know, test disabled, and that'll actually disable the test job. In fact, almost all the jobs you can disable if for whatever reason, you don't want to run any kind of static analysis. You don't need to do that. Or the license check. You want to turn that off. You can set variables to turn that off. So there's a bunch of ways you can configure auto DevOps just by setting environment variables. And then that means you don't have to, you know, you can customize it a little bit really easily. Um, but there is another way to customize it, which gets a little bit more interesting, is we have um, what we call composable auto DevOps, which is just uh, the template itself can actually be modified pretty easily. So I think what I'm going to do is demo this. Um, let's see what the best way to do it is. From here, I think if I go to add a file, and I pick the type is GitLab CI YAML, and then I pick Auto DevOps, it actually puts in literally this is the Auto DevOps script. So it's 93 lines. But most of the content is actually hidden behind these includes. So it's really easy to be like, OK, well, we've included build, we've included test, we've included code quality. Like These are all the jobs, and they're defined somewhere else. So if you want to turn one of them off, you can just delete it. If tests, well, I don't suggest you turn off tests unless it's really failing. But you could delete the template for tests, and then go and add another job to do tests differently. You want to override it. You want to run our spec in parallel with 70 pods running simultaneously or something like that. You can do that. But then you can keep the rest of Auto DevOps all be the same. So this is a really great way to start from the Auto DevOps template and then you know, augment it with whatever you need, you know, whatever your customizations are. You could also go the other way. And let's say I've got an existing GitLab CI YAML, and everything's great, but I just really want to add security testing. Well, then you could just include the parts that you need. You could just take you know, any part, well, all of those if you want, and then add them to your other existing GitLab CI YAML. And uh, it's probably worth explaining what this really does. So these templates, this, this include template, um, there's a you can include other things. Too. You can include files that are relative uh, within, your, within your repo. You can include files that are on other projects. You can include lots of things, which is a really great way to build up sort of a centralized you know, uh, repository of all the, your CI CD tools. And then you know, uh, different projects can include the things they want. But templates are a special case. Again, going back to this list, these are all templates. And you can basically just include any of these by just using this one line include. And so if you, you know, I'll just pick one here. So for container scanning, like this is the 62 lines of container scanning that you can just include with one line of GitLab CI YAML. There's a, and you know, actually, and there's a few other things like code quality. Like if you just wanted to add code quality to a project and nothing else, you could just you know, you could copy this literally, or you could just you know reference the include. And we really recommend using the includes because then, if we ever change things, if we improve how you know the static analysis job functions, then if you just include it, we, you'll always get the latest version. Whereas if you copied it in, then you'd always have it be stale. Yeah, question. So it literally looks for them in the same place that it looks for populating this list. There's a, 
Every, the, the GitLab server ships with these templates, and it, it looks in that spot for the templates. Um, but then also, if you, like, let's say at a group level, you add custom templates, then you could refer to them there as well. So it's in the place where the templates are, um, which frankly, I don't remember offhand where that actually is. They used to be different. They were vendored differently, but they live somewhere else now. Any other questions? You can. Um, there's a couple ways you can do that. Let's see. Um, I'm going to pull up the documentation here. So one of the ways you can do that is by setting the build pack. And so there's a couple of days, so there's a build pack URL you can specify. Um, there's also, you can set a file, um, like dot build packs. Um, anyway, there's documentation on it there. You can set this if you need to override the build pack. So if the detection is wrong, first off, you could do that. But also just, um, there are thousands of build packs out there and we only use maybe seven by default. And so if you've got a custom build pack for some framework that's not really normal or standard or other, I should say, um, then you can just point to that build pack instead, and then we'll build that way. I'll also add, though, you don't have to use build packs. Again, you could just provide a Docker file, which is really easy these days to create a Docker file. And again, if we detect a Docker file, then we'll skip the whole language detection thing. We'll just run the Docker file. Yeah. without a YAML file. So basically what we do is, the whole thing about auto DevOps is that if there is no YAML file, we will just use the, the one special YAML file that we've identified, which is the auto DevOps template. Yeah, and so that's, that's, that's the auto part of it, <laughs> basically. Any other questions? They do depend on external um, Docker images usually, um, especially like the code, quali uh, code quality one goes and pulls in uh, a bunch of different images. That uh, was one of the things we were talking about in the last workshop where uh, you know, there's some ways you can cache some of these things, um, but they're all gonna be pulled um, from the jobs. Oh, well, you don't need Auto DevOps to do review apps, right? Auto DevOps just give it to you without you having to configure anything. But you could set up any kind of custom pipeline and still just create review apps. Um, there's documentation about how to do it technically, but um, you know, however you build and deploy, you could, because again, Auto DevOps only works with Kubernetes, but lots of people deploy elsewhere. So yeah, you just need to construct your GitLab CI YAML. Um, with the review stage, exactly. And basically just define two jobs, one that creates the review app and one that destroys the review app. And you know, you create them in a certain way and all the magic happens. Is there a question back there somewhere? I thought it's a hand up. No. Nope. All right. Sorry? Well, Auto DevOps has been around for, yeah, well, well, it was in beta in 10 point something, and then I think we made it called GA in 11.0, but it was around for several months before then, um, and, and really quite functional, but there were a few things uh, that, we, that stopped it from being GA. Um, so anyway, so it's been around for quite a while, but we've also continued to evolve it. Um, you know, I don't know when we added browser testing, but I don't think that was 11.0, for example, and then all the security stuff has been added, and, so it's, it's obviously, like everything we iterate, it continues to evolve. Is the composable part 
Composable part is very new. That's only a couple months old. So it used to be that when you included Auto DevOps, it was you know, 300 lines of YAML, and, uh, which was fine, but it also meant then that like, when the security tests, the script itself changed, which did happen quite often. Um, it meant that anybody who had vendored in the, the, the template would potentially not get a, you know, get a, take advantage of those things. So using the includes really, really help. And, um, and, and I think it was only maybe within the last six months that includes even came down to core. And uh, so it was originally, I think, a starter feature. Maybe it was premium. But uh, it meant that we couldn't make use of it for something that might be used by core. And so, uh, but once that was done, it took a couple of months, and then, yeah, we, we made Auto DevOps composable. And I think, it personally, it really makes it a lot easier to get started, and you can see what it looks like, and then just make some small changes and override a few things. I believe it, they are. The template ones might not be, but um, like if you're pointing to another project, I think you can put the, you know, a ref in there and point to a specific branch or, or version or something like that. Um, I don't remember the specifics, like how, like if it works everywhere. Like sometimes you can just put in a URL and so then you can potentially put the version in the URL, but I don't think for templates you can. I could be wrong though. I don't know if Daniel remembers. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? All right, cool. Um, let me see. I think, where was I back then? I don't know that there's anything else. Yeah, that's it, really. Um, yeah. I, I don't think there's anything else to show except for maybe you know actually making some changes to the auto DevOps uh, or to the template. But I think we've covered about how to do it. Um, so I think it, it, it's enough to get you started if you wanted to start playing with it. If you remove them, then yeah, they just disappear exactly. And actually, one of the um, questions somebody had before is like, well, what if you're not on Ultimate? Then these security tests don't work. And I think, if I recall correctly, actually, I'll check it right now that um, like the container scanning um, actually has this only clause and, uh, and it will only run if you are licensed to run container scanning, um, which would mean you've got an ultimate license. And so if you're on anything other than that, then the job just disappears. The whole job just doesn't even get instantiated. So you would just see a smaller pipeline or well, it's, it's a parallel pipeline, so you'd see a smaller list. Um, which is pretty nice because it doesn't waste your time because what would happen when we first launched uh, Auto DevOps, we didn't have that capability. And it would mean we'd run the job, we'd do the analysis, and then we'd generate a file that represents you know, all the results. And then there's just nothing you could do with it because the rendering is actually what's licensed, not the running of the job. And so it's the display in the merge request of the security analysis that actually shows up. Like if I go back... Actually, I think I need to look at the merge quest. So if you look at this merge request, you'll see all these um, things there. So no changes in code quality, performance metrics improved on three points, which is kind of interesting. That sounds random um, because that didn't change much. Uh, security scanning detected no additional vulnerabilities and license management, no new licenses, like all that stuff. It's the display of it that is actually licensed. And so if you, so there's nothing wrong with running them on core, it's just that you can't see the results. Yeah. So it looks like, I don't know, it, it just looks like it's not particularly meaningful. So that would be like, you know, having an actual threshold there would make a lot of sense. Like three points is probably just not worth, that's, that's just variance. Yeah? Uh, are we planning this way to enable auto other platforms? That is a great question. We do not currently have any plans to do so. Um, well, to be clear, so uh, OpenShift, we have plans for that. 
um, but that's Kubernetes underneath, so it's not a different platform, but it is different enough that we actually sol have to solve problems differently. Um, one of the advantages of doing the composable auto DevOps, and we haven't quite hit there yet, but is I'd like to be able to sort of decouple the deployment mechanism from the rest of the structure. And, uh, and so if you wanted to override and say, I'm gonna deploy differently, you could potentially just change some different file, or even better, just include a different version. Like, so instead of including the Kubernetes deployer, you include the AWS VM deployer, or even the FTP deployer, or whatever, and you just include a different one, and then everything just works. Um, we're not there yet, um, and it's not honestly a priority. Like, Kubernetes is the top priority for us, and so making that work well is really important. But, uh, but I do expect that it's both possible and that there's you know some demand for being able to do auto devops to other platforms that is a great question um, I think we need to do some exploratory work to see if it's possible first but if it's possible then yes of course we should be able to document how to do that um, I'm really curious now that you say that if I look at the auto devops script whether it's whether I can just override one thing. Um, it wasn't, when we made it composable, the goal was to still within Kubernetes be able to select different things, but maybe another iteration would be then to make that part composable as well. And, and again, start with just the, the default one, the auto DevOps script only does Kubernetes, but at least, hey, if, you know, here's how you would modify it to do something else. And I know that my exploration work I did you know, geez, a year and a half ago or something like that, did explore that kind of stuff. So I know it's, it's conceptually possible, but maybe not with our current, current limitations. Yeah. So uh, other than the, the, the security scanning having an issue with, are, are there any other reasons why our DevOps wouldn't work in an air gap network? Or an instance on the network? That I'm thinking like per, pulling the peripheral loop. Right, well, the, if you're using the build packs, the pulling the build packs, well, I think actually um, we have a Docker image that has already pulled the build packs. So I don't think that's a problem. If you specify a build pack URL, then we wouldn't obviously be able to, well, unless you pointed it to an internal representation of it or something like that. Um, the code quality wouldn't work. Um, that pulls a bunch of Docker images. Um, Even by default, I think we still point to Docker images that might be like on GitLab.com. So you might still have to mess with that. I don't know, it's worth looking at. Because right now there isn't a lot specified, but within the jobs there might be you know, URLs that are pointing to specific places. And I know the security ones obviously are a challenge, but, uh, but I don't know about the rest. That's a great question. Um, I think, I don't know if I can pull up metrics right now that will actually say, but uh, AutoDev is one of those things where um, people love the idea and it actually really helps people get sold on the idea behind GitLab and everything else. But that doesn't mean that they're actually running the like unmodified AutoDev Ops script, but they're still inspired by that. And they'll you know, use the structure. And again, it's, it's even easier now with the composability thing. I don't know if we have any data of how much people are using the composable version. But it's even easier to start with that and then just modify the parts that you need to, again, including potentially changing how to deploy. Like in worst case, like I said, the, the composable, like it'd be nice to be able to just change one line. But worst case, you could still do all the rest and say the, the part that does the deploy, rip that out and then write your own. And then. It, there's more writing you have to do, but it would be easy enough to do, and then be like, okay, this is how I do review apps, this is how I do production, et cetera. Anyway, so I think you've got a lot of adoption of the principles of Auto DevOps and, and some parts of it, but of just actually using Auto DevOps as the thing without any modifications, I'd say that's probably fairly low. Um, I think that it's, it's a great way to get started, but a lot of people have customizations after that. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you, everyone.